Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Phil. Amen. Good morning, friends. So good to see each of you here that have come and you're braving the rain. And uh, this is a, a special opportunity for the Granite Bay Hilltop Church to be able to host the uh, Pacific Union ASI group. For our friends that are watching, uh, ASI stands for Adventist Layman Services and Industries. And it's basically a wonderful organization that we've been part of for years that uh, especially highlights engaging regular laymen in using their influence, their, their businesses to witness for Christ and to also help spread the message overseas. And uh, uh, nothing could really be closer to the heart of Granite Bay than mobilizing the members for ministry. Amen? The harvest is great, the labors are few. Once again, want to welcome our friends that are watching on AFTV or the Good News Network or Facebook, YouTube, and the different outlets. And our members, we have Granite Bay members around the world. Welcome to you as well. We're glad you're tuning in for this special Sabbath where we are going to be talking about treasure. Where is your treasure? Where are you storing your treasure? You know, it's... Uh, Appropriate that we're discussing this because we're right here where it all happened, in gold country. Uh, some of you know what gold fever is. Well, back in 1846, San Francisco was a sleepy community with about 200 people. And then just up the hill from where we are right now, and near Sutter Creek in Coloma, a guy named John Marshall was building a mill for a man named Sutter. He's got Sutter Fort down here in Sacramento. And uh, in digging the water around the mill, they're going to have a water-powered mill. Saw some gold flecks and, as they say, Eureka. When he noticed that, it really changed the history of the world. Do you know that just in the time between the discovery of gold in 1848 and 1852, San Francisco grew to over 32,000 people. I think you got a, one of the original pictures there that you can see on the screen. There's an old timer there and you got a picture of San Francisco. The bay was full of ships and the people could not get anything out because all the ships that came in, the sailors left the ships and they wanted to go dig for gold. And so these ships were all stranded with no crew that were stuck. Some of them just abandoned. They just let them burn because they couldn't get anyone to get on boats to sail away. Everybody wanted to come in. You know, I understand that so many people are leaving California. It's kind of the reverse of gold fever now. That their U-Haul is paying people to bring the U-Hauls back from Tennessee and Texas <laughs> and Idaho. It's true. <laughs> amazing all these people because of the dream of quick treasure they um, they got gold fever and it was one of the greatest migrations people came from across the east coast they came over land they went around south america they crossed by the panama canal they came from australia they came from china and it was an explosion one of the biggest migrations of humanity for gold now i understand it a little bit they have a men's retreat up in Alaska every couple of years, and I guess it's every year. I've been twice. I took Stephen once. I took Nathan once. And uh, it's on a, it's a men's retreat. It's out in the back country of Alaska. You, you can only get there by riding a quad 16 miles. It's on a gold claim where you can fly a plane in. I've done both, and you land on the river. And... Uh, the old timer there, Ken, who has it, he'll let the guys that come to the men's retreat, he'll hand them a gold pan and say, knock yourself out, see if you can find any gold. And so he was showing Nathan and I how to do this. And um, I think, you know, Nathan found a little bit of color, they call it a little dust. You know, it's a lot of work, shovels and shovels in the pan, he keep working it down, and so you get a dust, ooh, it's really exciting. But I know a little bit about it. 
And so I said, well, Ken, do you mind if I dig right here where this creek's come in? No. I unlodged a big boulder and got a big scoop of material and put it in the pan, and we washed it down and found some nuggets. Boy, I was so excited. I said, can I go again? He said, no. Because <laughs> he said, you just, you just found where it's coming in at. I'm not letting you get any more. And it just so happens. Oh, that's my chapstick. Hang on. Wait. <laughs> I've got, I got my treasure. I found, and that doesn't look like much. That's gold. I took it in. I actually took it and had it weighed. It's $50. I'm not, so, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take 100 for it. For me, the joy was finding it. Just the idea of finding something that's so precious. It, it's, it's exciting. I'd like to go back to the men's retreat. You know, one of the greatest treasure hunts in history and one of the greatest discoveries took place in Egypt when an Egyptologist, Howard Carter, he had spent years looking for a missing king. They knew where most of the kings were in the line of the Egyptian pharaohs and they'd found their tombs and their tombs had all been plundered and there's nothing there but, you know, garbage robbers had cleaned them out years ago and and people that were searching for valuable artifacts, but he knew that one still seemed to be missing. And he got a sponsor, Lord Carvanon, to sponsor him searching for this missing King Tutankhamun for five years. And finally, his benefactor said, look, we're cutting it. He said, we, we, he said one more year, I'm so close, I know it's here. So he sponsored one more year, and just within a couple of months of all the money drying up and his getting sent home, some of his workers said, you know, it looks like we've uncovered a pit with some rocks in it, and it seems like it might be an entry, and it turned out it was a staircase, and they cleaned it out, and it led up to a sealed door. You got the picture on the screen there? The seal had not been broken, 3,000 years. And he called his benefactor to come, and they eventually took a bunch of pictures, made a little hole in the wall, they stuck a candle in, and he said, do you see anything? He said, yes wonderful things. That little candle was glinting off the gold that does not fade, and there was gold everywhere. And they pulled out 5,000 articles of this tomb, and his, his coffin, you've probably seen the priceless face mask of the young king. He was only 19 years old, the young king. He was a poor king. He didn't even get a pyramid. He was built down on the ground in a tomb. His body was found, his mummy was found in a nest of seven coffins. The innermost coffin, that's the, the face mask, there's one of the coffins, that's a coffin in a coffin, his mummy's in that, but the outer coffin there, 240 pounds solid gold. Yeah, see, you're excited about gold too. <laughs> Get a little gold fever? <laughs> and... Uh, with that in mind, yeah, and then Karen and I just, uh, last year, we were in Egypt, and uh, we went to visit the Cairo Museum and uh, see all the treasures that they, they discovered there. And it makes you think, what does it mean in the Bible when it says Moses was willing to walk away from the treasures of Egypt? Keep in mind, King Tut was a poor 19-year-old pharaoh can you imagine what was in the tombs of the pharaohs that built the great pyramids? It's incomprehensible. And to know that all of that could be yours, and it says, let's read it together in Hebrews 11, verse 24. By faith Moses, this is 24 to 26, when he became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, being a king of Egypt. He esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches, greater treasure than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. What reward was he looking to? The treasures on earth or the treasures in heaven? There are really only two options the Bible gives us. And we'd like to talk about putting our treasures in the right place. Let's go to that uh, familiar uh, message you find in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, in your Bibles. We're going to read verses 6 
uh, chapter 6, verse 19 to 24. And I think we're all acquainted with this passage. Jesus is telling us about a lot of different things. He talks about the model prayer, about oaths, about loving your enemies. And then he begins to talk about true wealth. Verse 19, Matthew chapter 6, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroys and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So important that your heart's in the right place and for that to be the case, your treasure needs to be in the right place. Then he goes on and says in verse 22, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good or single, focused, your whole body is full of light. All, assuming you all have decent vision, your mind is full of pictures and images and light right now because your eye is good. If you don't have your eye working, you get darkness. But if your eye is bad, if your eye is evil, you've heard the expression, the evil eye, uses that same phrase here in the original Aramaic. If your eye is evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you in dark is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in mammon. Now, we don't use the word mammon very often. It's just another word for riches, meaning the wealth of the world or earthly treasure. Now notice in this passage, he talks about two options. You don't get a third option. The Bible's clear that you've either got, there's two treasures you can choose from, treasure in heaven, treasure on earth. There's two visions, a vision with an eye towards God or towards the world. One is light, one is darkness. Then you've got two masters. It doesn't specify, but one is serving the Lord, the other serving the devil. If you're, he says, you can't serve the Lord, store your treasure in heaven, and serve mammon. Well, if you're not serving the Lord, if you're going after mammon, then that's earthly treasure. So we all really have these two options. Where are you storing your treasure? You're making that decision now. And it's really good for us to evaluate every now and then what our priorities are. One way you can figure out where you're putting your treasure is if your house was on fire, what would you want to get out first if you had limited time? Pets, pictures. I never hear anyone say kids. <laughs> Just, I always think, get the pictures, get the pets. I think, if you got a good pet, he's going to get out. But <laughs> so you got a canary or something. But uh, the, the pictures, you know what a lot of people say now? The hard drive. Get your, you know, there's so much information on the, the uh, computer these days, unless you get it backed up on the cloud. And then there's going to be, you know, kind of family heirlooms, things that are irreplaceable, that have a lot of memories attached to them that have been passed down. And uh, do you got a bug out list? You know what that is? In the event of an emergency, it's not a bad idea to have a list of what some of those crucial things are so you don't need to start thinking about it while the house is burning. And if you had to flee for your life, what would you grab and take? Not a bad idea to think about that. Do you know Jesus said the time is going to be coming when you'll be given a signal. He said, if you're in the field, don't go back to your house. If you're on the roof, don't get your coat. You might need to take off in a hurry. You know, if there's going to be a hurricane, we don't have in California, but earthquake or something where you lose power. Or we lose power just because of uh, windy days now. But um, good to have some water. Have some emergency supplies. But if your house is on fire, what's your treasure? You've got things that are valuable. What is your treasure when the world's on fire? What is really valuable to you? You know, you can tell what a person's treasure is based on what you do with your time, your talk, and your talent, and your money, which would be your treasure. You can tell, what do people talk about? You know, Jesus addressed that you can tell what's in the heart. If your treasure's in the right place, your heart's in the right place. 
by what you talk about. Matthew 12, 34. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure in his heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure in his heart brings forth evil things. You know, I've got some friends that whenever I give them half an opportunity, if I bring up the subject of fishing, brace for impact. They love fishing. It is amazing how much is involved in catching a fish. And they will tell you the best places, the best weather. They'll talk about the best. There's an art to casting if you're going after trout fishing. Then they talk about the feathers. And there's a whole science of how to tie off a feather for different fishes, different times of day. I've learned a lot just by sitting and listening to my friend talk about fishing. And they, they get the boats, and they'll have like a bass boat, spend $50,000, and it's got a radar for finding the bass. And you want to get, if there's a tournament, you got to get to the good bass before the other boats. And um, the right chair and the, <laughs> the right cooler and all the things that you need for catching a fish. You know, you can go to Walmart for $2 and get a can of sardine. <laughs> but for them, they just, they love fishing. And they talk about it because it's in their heart. People talk about sports. Pastor Ross and I play racquetball with a, a crew of people from around the community uh, once or twice a week, and they get together. They always know what's going on with the games. You know, the basketball, football, uh, what am I forgetting? Baseball. And then they'll always know, did you see the score? Did you see that? And they're just, you know, they talk about it, and they, they just light up, and they get all excited about it. And, and uh, a lot of people will go to a sporting event They'll sit in the snow at a football game and they won't come to church if there's a cloud. <laughs> you can tell and they talk about it. Young lady falls in love. She finds Mr. Perfect, tall, dark, and handsome. And you want to talk to her about her education. She just wants to talk about her boyfriend. And whatever subject you bring up, if you say you're going to talk about the price of flowers and tulips in Amsterdam, she says, that reminds me of my boyfriend. And it's anything you say, it becomes a segue to talk about what's in her heart. And then you meet the boyfriend, you think, what in the world is she thinking? <laughs> so what do you talk about? That's what's in your heart. Now, it's not bad to, you know, have a hobby of fishing and the different, it, you know, God wants us to have interests. I like I'm wondering how much I can tell you without ruining my reputation. <laughs> I, like, I like solar, electric, alternate power. If you bring it up, I'll go into my, my tirade. I, just, I really enjoy talking about alternate means to energy and, and uh, wind and solar and those things. And, you know, that kind of turns my crank. And uh, you want to talk about, you know, riding quads in the mountains, I, I, I get excited, I get engaged. I like aviation. And so there's, you know, we all have our interests, that's okay, but where's your treasure? Do you like to talk to people about Jesus? For me, the highlight is when I see a life that's been changed, I can't tell you how exciting it is for me, and what a privilege because I'm in a position where I use my gift to preach, and I, I kind of am on the front lines of meeting people who are uh, affected by that. And I meet someone, and they'll say, you know, praise the Lord, we accepted Jesus because of watching a program or reading Amazing Facts Bible studies or something like that. And you have no idea what a thrill that is. And, and to be able to go to heaven, be able to meet people and see them through eternity. You know, for me, and I tell pastors when I meet with pastors, I say, you have the best job in the world. You've got the best job in the world because I am thankful for a good doctor. You know, everybody needs a good doctor you can trust. It's nice to have a good attorney, an honest attorney. You may need one in life. If you've got a good auto mechanic, an honest auto mechanic, that's great. And a good carpenter. Amen? That's an honest contractor. Those things come in handy. But I tell you what, when Jesus comes, you're not going to have your car in heaven. 
There's going to be doctors will be unemployed. Lawyers will be unemployed. Amen? You're not going to need a carpenter, an auto mechanic, any of those things. But the work that you do in soul winning, you will see the results of lives changed forever. So what you're doing now in reaching people is what really matters because it's what really lasts. And Jesus had that priority. He said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Jesus invested all of his time and attention in reaching people. I mean, right to the very end when he was hanging on the cross, he was worried about his mother, and he saved a thief hanging next to him. And he talked to the women that were weeping on the way to the cross. I mean, Jesus was interested in these other souls, and he prayed for the people crucifying him. He was interested in saving people. But we get distracted with so many other things. So what do you do with your talk? What do you do with your time? How much time do you spend frittering away on YouTube, TikTok, Facebook? It's kind of like, you know, digital gossip. Now, I'm not saying these things don't have some use. Amazing facts. Post things on Facebook and YouTube. I mean, it can be a medium, but I know a lot of people that spend a lot of time. They don't ever read their Bibles, but they got time for the television programs, and, and they'll binge watch things on Netflix, but they don't have time for soul winning, giving a Bible study, personal devotions. You can tell where a person's heart is by how they spend their time. Do you have time to study how to study with others? What do you do with your treasure? Now, I'm talking about the treasure in the terms of your financial resources. You can tell. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13, you know, Matthew, I can preach completely out of Matthew when you talk about this because Matthew was an accountant. He says more about treasure than the other gospel writers. It was really close to his heart. He had to get up. Matthew understands. He had to walk away from his cash register to follow Jesus. And he did. And, you know, when Jesus tells the parable about the sower who sows the seed, and, you know, some is on the path, and some of the birds get it, and some is on rocky ground, and some is on good ground, and some falls on the thorny ground. Notice what he says here. He, this is Matthew 13, 22. He who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and he initially sprouts. He's interested. But the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. The plant's alive, but it doesn't really ever bear any fruit because it's being strangled by the other plants. And he calls it, he says, the deceitfulness of riches. Now, riches in themselves are not a problem, but when you get distracted with that as the goal, it chokes out everything else. And the way that one plant chokes another plant, they don't jump out of the alley like Jack the Ripper and grab you by the throat or choke someone out like in a cage fight. Plants choke each other slowly. Isn't that right? Some people are slowly being choked by the cares of this life and by material things. How much do you need to be happy? Someone asked Rockefeller one time, how much money does it take to be happy? You know what he said? A little more. <laughs> I read a... Uh, matter of fact, I'm going to tell the studio, I, I wasn't planning on saying this now, but... Uh, jump ahead, I'm going to show a picture of uh, Chuck Finney. Yeah, there he is, Charles Finney. Finney. This guy is an amazing uh, uh, guy. He was a billionaire, had $8 billion, made his money. You ever go through the airport and they've got those um, tariff-free goods, what do they call it, the, uh, I'm not using the right, duty-free, yeah, the duty-free shops. He kind of invented that after he got out of the military and he just made a lot of money, made good investments, had billions of dollars, and then he just had an epiphany. He said, you know, it'd be a shame for me to die rich. And he just started giving it away. He provided something adequate for his children. 
out of $8 billion, he put aside $2 million for himself, did not own a car or a house. He died in a rental. And then he would secretly give away money. And you can understand that because if you're giving, you're a billionaire, you're giving away money. As soon as people get word, wouldn't you want to be friends with that person? So he had to do it very secretly. But he'd fly, coach, around the country. He'd go visit. He was from Ireland, so he'd visit these schools in Ireland. And he'd just be given money, humanitarian purposes. And he died last year, 93 years old. He had given it all away. Bill Gates and Warren Buffett said, he is their hero. You ever heard the expression? If you're giving while you're living, then you're knowing where it's going. So what do you do with your treasure? By the way, I think that as we are faithful in giving, God refills. And He gives you more opportunity because He wants us to be a channel of blessing. And if we stagnate in our giving, He can't fill this hand because He's still holding on with something with this hand. And so as we become a channel and we are giving faithfully, He fills the other hand. I, that's been my experience. I've never been able to outgive God. So what do you do with your treasure? 1 Peter 5, 4, and he's talking especially to pastors here. He says, don't be preaching for filthy lucre. He said, do it for the Lord. And when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive a crown that does not fade away. There's treasure that comes. Philippians 4, 16 and 17, Paul says, even those in Thessalonica, you did aid once and again to my necessities. Paul is praising the Philippians because they would give to him when he was in prison and when he had struggles and he had no money. And he said, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. What account was Paul telling the Philippians was being filled? Did Paul have a transfer? He was transferring money to their account? Or is he talking about the heavenly account? Do you know you've got a heavenly account? You do. All of us. Some of us are overdrawn. And some of us are laying away. We're storing treasure in heaven. Do you know there are varying degrees of rewards? So, do you want to be on welfare in heaven? Or, or do you want to be rich? Most of us are thinking, I just want to be there, amen? <laughs> but I think you're thinking small. You should have security. I'm going to be there, and I want him to say, you know, Jesus says, great is your reward. And why would he say that if it didn't matter? I don't just want to be there. I want to be among the ones he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Heard about this wealthy duchess. And after the second coming and the first resurrection, the angel takes her to heaven. She was good. She was a Christian. She makes it. And the angel takes her over to her mansion. She's walking by all these beautiful, splendid mansions in the, in the New Jerusalem. And, and he, he leads her up to this humble marble hut. And she said, oh, thank you. It's got a little gold trim around it. And she said, this is mine. This is yours. She said, are you sure? He looks at the ledger. He says, I'm sure. It's got your name on it. And she looks up on the hill and she said, there's a beautiful, big, sprawling mansion. She says, whose is that? He looks, he says, that's your gardener. <laughs> How does he rate? Well, it's a record that says that uh, he sent ahead a lot more materials than you did. But I know I gave more to charity than he did. I said, we don't go by the amount. We go by the amount of sacrifice. You may have given 10000 out of your $50 million, but he gave $50 out of his 100 And you see a great big mansion up on the hill. Whose is that? Oh, that belongs to a widow. She gave two mites, but it was all she had. So we're all sending stuff ahead, and it's not just by our giving. Don't, don't think that by giving away, somehow it converts into money in heaven. We're storing treasure in heaven not just by being generous, though that is part of it. It's also your talents and your influence for God. You know, Jesus makes a statement that's kind of troubling, again in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. And I used to think, and it's still part of it, that 
You know, your life is made of time. If you had no time, you have no more life. Did you know that? Your life is made of time, and there are people that will take all your time and never produce or change, and they just become a black hole, and the devil wants to distract us. But I think it's even more than that. It's your talents. God has given you talents, and some people give their talents to the devil. How many of you have known stories of people that they got a gift for, like, singing? They start out singing in church, and then they're so gifted, people say, you know, you can make a lot of money with that gift. Next thing you know, they're singing for the world. And you talk about people like Elvis Presley and Whitney Houston that were just so talented, started in church, and got sucked into the machine of Hollywood, and they self-destructed. And the devil wants us to cast the pearls of our talent to the devil. And God says, whatever your gifts and your talents are, use them for me. Amen? Someone wrote a poem. My life will touch a dozen lives before this day is done. Leave countless marks of good or ill ere sets the evening sun. This wish I always wish, the prayer I always pray. Lord, may my life help other lives it touches by the way. Every day, in everybody that you meet, in your conversation, and through your various gifts and influence, you are storing treasure, one way or the other, and you can't escape it. It's going to happen. No man is an island. We all influence each other. Like the father who tells his wife and kids, well, I want you to be saved. I want you to take the kids to church. I'm going to stay home. Your influence is going to make a bigger difference than your order. They're going to look at what you do. There's a statement from the book Christ Object Lessons, a classic book that's a commentary on the teachings of Christ. Page 340, talking about influence. Listen to this. Every soul is surrounded by an atmosphere of its own. It might be charged with a life-giving power of faith, courage, and hope, and sweet with the fragrance of love, or it might be heavy and chill with the gloom of discontent and selfishness, or poisonous with the deadly taint of cherished sin. By the atmosphere surrounding us, every person with whom we come in contact is consciously or unconsciously affected you may not be conscious, but we're all affecting each other. This is a responsibility from which we cannot free ourselves. Our words, our acts, our dress, our depart deportment, even the expression on our countenance has an influence. As you go through the day frowning, you're storing treasure on earth. When you smile, you're storing treasure in heaven. So let's all make a deposit right now. Upon the impressions thus made, there hangs a result for good and evil that no man can measure. Every impulse thus imparted is a seed sown that will produce its harvest. If by our example we aid others in the development of good principles, we give them the power to do good. In their turn, they exert the same influence upon others and they still upon others. Thus, by our unconscious influence, thousands are blessed. It's a chain reaction. Throw a pebble in the glassy lake and a wave is formed and another and another and they increase and the circle widens until it reaches the very shore. So with our influence, beyond our knowledge our, or our control, it tells upon others in blessing or cursing. Every day, we are going to make a difference. We are storing treasure by what we talk about, by what we do with our resources, what we do with our time, what we do with our talents and our influence, it's making a difference. So how do we store treasure in heaven? Well, you know, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the earthly things you need will be added. So one thing is live righteously. Now there's a problem with that. It's easy to say, it's hard to do, isn't it? That's not what I was going to say, though. Here's what the problem is. If you live righteously, you're going to have problems. The Bible says, 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Do you know you get to store treasure with persecution? These are the words of Christ. Luke 6.22, blessed are you when men hate you, 
when they exclude you and they revile you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven. How do you get big treasure in heaven? Live righteously, you'll be persecuted. <laughs> Overcome evil with good, and you get big treasure. James 1.12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he'll receive a crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those that love him. Love the Lord, live a godly life. You'll have challenges, and he promises you a crown. Another way you store treasure in heaven, give generously. Matthew 25, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. And they say, but Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or naked, a stranger or prison, and take care of you? He'll say, and as much as you did it for one of the least of these, you did it for me. Do you know Jesus is quoting from the Old Testament when he says that? Proverbs 19, 17. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. When you're giving to the poor, what does God say? You get it back. When you care about others and you're generous and you're helping others, you're not really giving anything away. You're transferring it. Because the Lord says, you're giving to me and you're going to get it back. He'll bless you in this life and then there's treasure in heaven. Amen? Mark 10, 21. You know the story about the young man. He was rich in earthly treasure. He said, Lord, what good thing shall I do that I might have an everlasting life? And Jesus said, why do you call me good master? No one is good but one, and that's God. But if you would enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said, which ones? Because the Jews had a lot of different laws in the Talmud. And, and Jesus begins to quote from the Ten Commandments. He actually is quoting from the Ten Commandments to deal with man's relationship with his fellow man. Because this man, while he, you know, he may have just worshipped God and kept the Sabbath and paid his tithe and all that, he wasn't that loving of his brother. And Jesus said, uh, in the Bible, so Jesus looking at him loved him. And he said, if you would be perfect, go sell what you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Now, I don't think the Lord is asking everybody here to, to liquidate and give it to the poor. Um, I know that because Paul says, those of you who are rich, remember to give. So it was assumed there would be people who were prosperous. But for this man, he was actually offering him something even more. He said, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus asked him the same thing he asked Peter, James, John, Andrew, Matthew. It says they walked away from their nets. They walked away from the cash register. They followed Jesus. He told this man, you go liquidate and then follow me. There could have been a book in the Bible with his name on it. But he, having great possessions, he said, oh, that's crazy. Who could do that? And he walked away grieved and rich. His whole body was full of darkness because his eye was dark because he was looking at the earthly treasure. How sad. And then Jesus went on and explained to the disciples, it's harder for a rich man to get into the kingdom than an camel to get through the eye of a needle. So give generously, live righteously, speak faithfully. We talked about talking. Again, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, an evil man, evil things. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If what you're talking about isn't right, then you need a heart change, amen? So to get your treasure in the right place, you need the heart in the right place. And that sometimes is painful. It involves a heart transplant. The Lord, to, for, to disentangle ourselves from the things of the world. You know, that happens through the Word. Truth is a treasure. Psalm 19, verse 10, The Word of God is more desired than gold, than much fine gold. Psalm 119, verse 72, 
The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. Is God's truth a treasure for you? See, that's what changes hearts. The Word of God. If anything good comes out of this sermon, it's God's Word. It's God's message. It touches our hearts. The seed sprouts. Proverbs 8, 11. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all things that one might desire cannot be compared to her. My fruit is better than gold, yes, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. Paul says when we're converted, he says, you've got treasure in earthen vessels. The treasure of truth is in our lives. Jesus was the Word incarnate. When we become Christians, the Word of God is lived out in our lives. So the Word of God can change our hearts through prayer, through the power of His Word, and then the Holy Spirit. You know, we've been to the Cairo Museum, and we've seen King Tut's treasures there in the museum, and they got pretty good security. They've just built a multi-billion, I don't know if it's multi, but it's over a billion dollar museum in Cairo, and they're moving everything there. When we were there, they hadn't moved it yet, but it's a, we saw it from a distance, big, beautiful museum. But you know the security, the most secure museum in the world doesn't have any gold. It's in Israel. It's called the Shrine of the Book. It's the museum that holds the Dead Sea Scrolls. It has got, I think, like six feet of reinforced concrete to try to survive a bomb blast. It's got fountains around it to put out any fire. It's got the, the most sophisticated security systems. Uh, and when you go in there, what do they got? Parchment with words. They get the scriptures. And it's their most sacred treasure. We've got this treasure in earthen vessels. And they even made... They even made the museum roof to look like the lid of one of the jars where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. I, I remember reading an amazing fact. It sort of fits here, so I'll share it. Back in the 1800s, there was a man named Al Schilling. He actually, you've heard of the Sing Sing prison? He was in Sing Sing, and he, the guard found him dead one day, and as they were preparing to remove his body, he had been a professional forger. He helped, you know, forge counterfeit plates, and he was really good at forging. And, and the, the guard noticed he had six pins that were neatly stuck through his lapel pocket on his prison clothes. And the guard saw that one of them was gold, and he realized the other six were silver, and he pulled them out. And he wondered if it was real gold, and he took a magnifying glass, and he looked at this one gold pin, and he saw something unusual on the top of the pin. And... Looking closely, he said, that looks like there might be some writing. They got a more powerful magnifying glass, and they discovered that this guy, in his spare time, he had engraved the Lord's Prayer, all 240 words, plus the word amen, on the head of a gold pin. He had actually done it on the silver pins, too, but the gold was a masterpiece. The gold is so fine that you could do that, and that's a picture of it there. The whole Lord's Prayer on the head of a gold pin. And God wants His Word written in our hearts. You know, uh, I remember reading history. I just finished going through this story about Pizarro and the conquest of South America and how Francisco Pizarro, with less than 200 men, he went into the capital of the Inca Empire and um, very shrewdly realizing the people worshipped the king, Athalupa, they captured him, and the people, his guards, were so afraid. Some of them were cut down by the guns, and the, the horses they had, were, they'd never seen them before. And he had big dogs, and the men are wearing armor, and they just didn't know what to think. And in, he basically helped the king, kidnap the king, put him in prison. And the king said, if you'll let me go, he says, we can fill this room. Gold is what you want. We can fill this room with gold. And they thought he was kidding. He said, no. He sent the word out with his carriers that went over 2,000 miles through his empire and they began to carry gold over the period of months and he filled one room that was 18 by 22 feet with gold, gold treasures, articles, things, eight feet high and two other rooms with silver as a ransom to be freed. You talk about a king's ransom and Pizarro still killed the young king. That always just breaks my heart for someone to pay a king's ransom and then not get their freedom, still die in prison. 
They conquered a nation of five million. There's a king who's paid a ransom for you worth a lot more than what the Inca king paid. How sad, what a shame for that ransom to be paid and for you not to utilize it. Amen? You know, I was also looking through history the other day and I was reading about the, um, well, I'll tell you how this happened. Is I want a helicopter. Now, I'm not fishing for a helicopter. I know some Pentecostal preachers tell everyone they want a jet. I'm not doing that. I, I, if you offered me one, I wouldn't take it. You know, someone actually offered me an airplane. I turned it down. I just, yeah, no, it's not right. It doesn't look good. Bad optics. But I wanted a helicopter. I can want one because I can't get to my ranch in the winter. It's all snowed in. But I thought if I had a helicopter, I could get in. So I don't know how, but I ended up looking at the World War, the Vietnam War helicopters. And then I heard the story about the evacuation of Saigon back in 1975 when they realized that the North Vietnamese were going to take Saigon. America was pulling out. And everybody had to get out very quickly. And the thing back then, you know, America wanted to honor its commitment and the South Vietnamese that had helped and supported the troops had translated and done a lot of work. They said, if you leave us behind, we will certainly be killed. And they had to evacuate them, thousands of them, because they knew that they, they were going to be surrounded, they'd be killed. We had ships offshore, and as the helicopters were ferrying the refugees, all the troops were already saved, but they were ferrying as many refugees as they could. The deck of the aircraft carrier ran out of room, and their helicopters, sometimes eight of them, hovering, waiting for a place to land and let off more. They're running out of fuel, and the captain said, clear the deck, push them off in the sea. And I saw that, I thought, no, I want a helicopter. <laughs> but then I realized, People are worth more than helicopters. And then there was a, uh, one of the uh, Vietnamese pilots, he, they realized all the helicopters were gone and he wanted to save his family. He knew, he, he flew for South Vietnam. He was an ally and, and all the jets were gone and he found this one little, it's the equivalent of like a 150 um, Cessna they call it a spotter plane and he took that and he stuffed his wife and his kids in there and he flew out to the aircraft carrier and he circled and he's waiting and the captain said you know I know this guy he flew with us he's going to ditch in the sea he will not survive a helicopter some of the helicopter pilots they told him ditch in the sea after you let everyone off they survived they could do that a little plane like that the impact it's like hitting concrete and he said, clear the deck for a, a landing, for a little airplane. And this guy had never made a landing on an aircraft carrier where the, you know, the runway's going up and down and the wind is blowing. And, and uh, they pushed jets and other multi-million dollar aircraft off to save this family. I always thought, that's the way it ought to be. What profit is it if you gain the whole world and you lose people? You know, how much more is a person worth, Jesus said, than a sparrow or a sheep? He says, you're worth many sparrows. You're worth more than many sheep. And nothing is worth more than people. Jesus came to save people. And that should be our treasure. That is the most important treasure to save in heaven. And so whatever we do with our time, our influence, our means, our talk, we should always be focused on getting as many people as we can into heaven. I think I've got a picture of the aircraft carrier where they got like 50,000 refugees spilling off the ship because they realized people and those folks they came to live a free life and have families and in a wonderful world and that's what we're really working for amen I'm gonna invite our singers to come up we're gonna sing our closing hymn we're gonna sing about reaching souls far and near the fields are teeming 358 if you have your hymnals and after our choir sings, I'll have closing prayer and then remain seated. We do have a closing announcement. Let's stand.
Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the reminder about what treasure really matters. Help us, Lord, with our treasure, our talk, our time, our talents, to have Jesus be the priority, to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, and remembering that everything we say and do through the day will tell somehow towards eternity. I pray that you'll help us to focus on what really matters. Bless each person here. Help us know how to apply this message in our lives that we might reach more souls for your kingdom and be with us now through this Sabbath day. We thank you and ask in Jesus' name, amen.